Women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but only 20% of its leadership. On her story, we'll explore the careers of bold and influential women from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill and learn how they've overcome the odds. I'm your host, Sandra Jane, and this is Her Story, a program where we explore what's beyond the glass ceiling. So I'm so excited to welcome Miriam Paramore, President and Chief Strategy Officer of Optimize Rx, to Her Story this morning. Miriam, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Sanjula. Miriam was my uh, first official Nashville Welcome Committee member, um, bringing me into the healthcare ecosystem, and is really a tremendous leader who has couple of great different uh, stories to tell us about her journey in the healthcare technology and data sphere, which we'll jump into in a minute. Um, for context, Miriam, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you actually do at Optimize RX? Well, let me start with our company and, and what I do, what the business does, and then I'll, I'll talk about my role a little bit. So Optimize RX is a digital platform. So we fall into the healthcare IT and digital health sort of sectors. And we really are a platform for digital communication between different stakeholders in the ecosystem. And that's kind of broad. So what does that mean? So we focus on medication access, affordability and adherence. So that's, you know, medication therapy, pharmaceutical therapy is a big part of people's uh, healthcare recovery and wellness journeys. And uh, a lot of times there are affordability and access problems. And there's oftentimes a misunderstanding about the information, whether it's the prescriber understanding a new medication or the patient understanding something that's new to them. And so the folks that make the medicine are the ones who have all of that information because they they made it, it went through trials, it's been approved, and now it's getting prescribed. Uh, But we don't have a really good way of digitally communicating that information from life sciences to providers, except through what was the old pharmaceutical sales rep model. So a person coming with samples, sitting down and spending time in person, that began to change over the last, you know, well, I don't know, probably 10 plus years. And of course, was completely shut down during COVID, during pandemic time. So how does this information about this medication get to the prescriber so that it can get to the patient? Well, on our platform, we transport, make that information liquid, transport it to the provider at the point of care so they can see and know all of what's new about the medications. Are there new formulations? Are there new black box warnings? Um, Are there new off-label expansions so that they can be the most informed at the time of treatment and get the patients what they need? Um, And that could be around what financial support is available and what patient support programs are available um, and what new clinical research is available. But making that digital bite size available at the point of care for prescribing treatment decisions. And then similarly, getting that information to patients via a sort of curated conversation on their smartphone that helps them to adhere to their medication therapy. Sometimes they're very complicated. People are polypharmacy. They have a lot of different conditions they're treating, a lot of different medications they're taking, and it can become confusing for the patient, especially over a long period of time. How do I take this? When do I take this? When do I need to go to the infusion center, et cetera? And and they need help and support. So those things can be digital, just like everything else is digital in our world. And that's what we do. We take what used to be delivered in person, deliver it digitally at, at through a device that that party is using with the doctor. It's their EHR. It's the computer system they use when they're treating patients. For the patient, this is our device that we use all day, every day to do our lives. So um, we do that to support um, access to medications, affordability of medications and adherence for providers and patients. Um, And that's really what gave me, uh, that's why I got passionate about taking on this role. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, what I've done before later, but um, the affordability of medications is a huge part of our health equity, you know, goals that we're reaching or trying to reach for as, as a country. So I see a, a, several things going on at the same time in terms of that landscape. One is the, uh, the push for health equity. We, we had some, uh, you know, focus on social determinants of health. We've had a, obviously huge public health awareness now, given our pandemic situation. Uh, and we also still have health equity issues with access to care in certain areas, whether they be urban or rural, and people's ability to access the care that they need and then afford the care uh, that they get. Um, We have, uh, you know, uh, the Accountable Care Act, which hoped to uh, help get more people insured, giving them, you know, another financial option to uh, pay for their medications or pay for their medications and procedures. They're all all their health care. So all of that stuff is coming together when technology, what we're using right now, makes possible what 
we would typically have to go to a studio somewhere and, and do in person. So, you know, the internet's real, all of digital communication is real, and then healthcare is seeking things that make um, access easier and affordability. And we can use information technology and communication technology, like what we're doing right now, to solve some of those problems and improve healthcare. So I just see those arcs continuing to come together, information technology maturity, technology mat maturity, digital health maturity, and the push for health equity um, across our nation. You know, one of the things I love about your story is that you were one of the first movers in the healthcare tech and data space before we, we really had these formal EHRs, before we had the iPhone, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But as you think about your leadership roles, both, you know, at Optimize Rx, but even well before then, do you consider your foray into kind of the healthcare leadership arena is more of an accidental kind of uh, path or was it more intentional? Well, when I graduated from college in 1983, three in December. Um, my first job was January 1984, and I was a programmer for uh, HCA. My degree is in math and computer science and um, from Belmont University here in Nashville. Then it was Belmont College, so it just meant it was smaller. Um, and it was, there weren't, there were, I think, like 10 people in the school that did math and computer science because we're really new. Um, and so my, uh, I would say it was an accident and I, I got into computer science side because I figured out that I had two opportunities in math. One was to teach and one was to be an actuary. And I have very little patience, so I'm not a good teacher. Um, and I thought of actuaries as people that sort of statistically counted, you know, death rates and <laughs> it just didn't sound interesting to me. So, um, but I loved the computer science idea. And so um, once I got into computers, I really loved uh, solving problems with technology. Um, I like jigsaw puzzles. So I really loved uh, applying the sort of logical uh, mindset of mathematics, which goes can be from very abstract to very discreet problems. And then um, thinking about computerizing all of that. And it uh, didn't take too long to see, um, to learn uh, how that could help in healthcare. And it wasn't, I would like to say it was intentional, but I was 21 years old. So nothing was really all that intentional then. It was, you know, get a job. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a job as a computer programmer for HCA. And that was my entrance into healthcare. Um, and we can we can talk more about that later, um, you know, if you want to. But from there, it just sort of stepped through, and I realized that I liked the complexity of the healthcare system in terms of it being big, a big system and big problems to solve. And I liked the the newness of technology, computer technology, and that it wasn't being used as a tool. It just really wasn't. It's was very very basic mainframe, very very basic processing. Of course, we didn't have the internet or personal computers or any of that stuff. So early days. We talk a lot about the role of women in STEM and, you know, encouraging more to, to pursue those career paths. I mean, you said your class of, you know, 10 studying that degree. I mean, how many women were in your class? Maybe just me. Maybe maybe there was another woman, but I don't, I'm not sure there, that there was in that major. Um, like, it, again, it was a small school. And so an even smaller population of us that were in that, that arena. And I had gotten a scholarship in mathematics before. And, you know, it just, we didn't have STEM then. It wasn't that intentional. I was really young when I went to college and, you know, I was just studying what I, what I found interesting. Um, and so I had that mathematics scholarship. And um, then I thought it, you know, I got into the computer side of it and it, that sort of took me over. I was, I was fascinated from there on. Um, so it's been interesting for me to watch over the last, it's 37 years now, um, the, the concept of STEM and women uh, with these focuses on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, right? Did I get that right? Um, I think that's right. Um, to become uh, an acronym and to become something that we can talk about. I'll give you a quick story. Um, our, one of our uh, board members has a daughter uh, who is, uh, I guess she's maybe now a senior at uh, a school, I'm not gonna name the school, but a, a major university. And he introduced me to her uh, a couple of years ago when at one of our board meetings that happened to be in the area where he lived. He said, I'd really like for you to meet my daughter because she's studying um, engineering and she's feeling a little ambivalent about whether she wants to continue because she's the only girl in any of her classes. And 
I was so taken aback by that. I mean, this is, to, I think it's 2021 right now. So this was like 2019 and that she just did not feel comfortable and, and was having, you know, was feeling a little bit unwelcome um, and a little bit like, what are you doing here? You know, this was her, her process of how, what she was experiencing. And I thought, wow, I don't like that at all. I don't like that at all. And, you know, because I don't like to think of us being as a society at a place now in, you know, 2020, 2021, that um, any girl or woman would feel uncomfortable um, in pr pursuing STEM. So that's how I know that we need to focus on that conversation. So I really appreciate that question. And as I spoke with her about it, um, she, she said, look, I just love the content and I love what I'm doing, but you know, it's a little bit of a boys club where it feels still feels to me that way. Just if, if for no other reason than representation of, you know, being female in that setting. So we made a lot of progress, but we have uh, a lot further to go. Well, to that point, you know, when we had talked earlier, you know, so being a researcher, of course, I had to go look up the stats. And so I think around the time when you pursued your degree in computer science, you know, on average, it was like 13 to 14 percent of, you know, those degrees were given to women. And I think now we've, we're closer to maybe 20%, but to your point, you know, it's still, we're still in the minority there. Tell us a little bit about, you know, I know you grew up outside of Nashville. Like how did your kind of where you grew up, your family influence kind of your decision to, you know, go out and take this big stride forward and, you know, pursue this degree path that was pretty uncommon for women at that time. It was very uncommon. Yeah. So my personal background is I, I grew up as a child in Nashville, but and a little bit in North Carolina. My family's from Eastern North Carolina and grandparents on both sides were farmers. So, um, you know, very uh, basic agricultural beginning that many of us here can appreciate and understand. Um, my parents uh, went to college um, at a religious school, very small religious school, and my dad finished and my mom uh, didn't. Um, but our, my generation was, so I'm uh, you know, I was born in 1963. So my generation was the Anjali generation, I call it. So there was, a, <laughs> I remember asking you about it. There was a, a perfume uh, commercial for Anjali and it was, it's spelled E-N-J-O-L-I. We should put it in here as a jingle, but I'm going to sing it for you. You ready? Okay. So yes, I can I'm ready. bring home the bacon, da, 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 fry it up in the pan, da, da. Never ever let you forget you're the man, jazz hands. So those three things, that was really the mantra that I was uh, raised with. You know, you, you can and should, in this order, get a degree, get married, and get a job, and have a career and have kids. And that should, you should do the, all of those things and in that order. And especially being in the South, um, it's really not acceptable or wasn't then to just be a single woman, you know, having a career. And, and I'm happy that we're beyond the, the, the need to, you know, why aren't you married if you're 25 or 30 years old, you know, sort of thing. Um, so I'm glad that we're past that. We seem to be past that uh, um, in our society, which is good. Um, but that sort of uh, mantra, that commercial really showed that what was appealing and what was being pushed was, yeah, it's okay for you guys to have jobs and, and work and but as long as you're married and as long as you keep the man happy and you cook dinner and kind of do a strip tease on the way from the door to the, the kitchen and, you know, have the kids taken care of too. So it was really an and, 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 and I have a big and sign behind me, but that's, that's for positive because there's <laughs> always something else. So there was a lot of, I felt a ton of internal pressure and I felt external pressure from my family to, um, uh, to be married and, and, and be traditional, be, do the traditional thing. Um, I also felt uh, pressure to um, be good at everything at the same time. And so I've always been very ambitious and I've loved solving problems and using technology. It takes a lot of time and focus to do those things. And so there was always a little bit of a, um, it's okay to be good in that, but just don't forget about all this other stuff, which you also have to be good at pleasing the man, stay married, have children, even just have, there was no like, would you like to have children? It's like, no, no, no. Everyone has children, you know, in this part of the country at that time. So, um, you know, given the fact that we were, you know, had the, the privilege of going to college and we were encouraged to go to college by our parents and have, get educations, 
it's a yes and, you know, then there is this, these other expectations. So, you know, that's sort of the framework that I grew up in and brought into the college setting. And at that time, most women that were going to college, they were choosing female friendly or, or more female oriented roles. Um, Belmont has a pretty big nursing school, as an example, which trends female and doesn't trend towards, you know, engineering or mathematics, um, as, as we just discussed. So since then, and I'll give a play forward a little bit to maybe some of our later conversation in the business world, where if you follow the money and kind of go up the chain from um, the entrepreneurial chain of you start with friends and family and angel, venture capital, private equity, um, and then the public markets, uh, the, the fewer and fewer women, that 20% to 13% to very, very small. And you're the researcher, you have the statistics. So we have that same, we have that same um, pattern that we have with women in STEM, with women in finance or women in banking or women in you know, private equity backed or women at board seats. Um, and that's a real opportunity for us. I do think a lot of women even today still feel that pressure, right? Yes, it may be more acceptable to, you know, delay getting married, you know, instead of your 20s, it's 30s or 40s. But the expectation to kind of do it all, as you described, is, you know, probably still there. So it's, it's refreshing to hear you kind of really share that that pressure that I think so many of us actually feel. I want to come back to some of the, the personal dimensions of that in a minute, but let's kind of go into your kind of trajectory from there. So you got your degree in computer science. You said your first job was at HCA. So you kind of lucked out by jumping straight into healthcare. Walk us through a little bit. You've really built a career around what I would call um, smaller growth stage, you know, tech companies. And you've kind of seen a lot of that activity over the course of, you know, the evolution of the industry in parallel too. What's kind of the kind of tell us about kind of where you started leading up to Optimize RX, you know, MD on and some of the other uh, stints that you've had across the way and how you've um, viewed the landscape within that? I view my career as sort of having three sections. And the, the first section was, you know, just get a job, <laughs> get a job and then figure out, you know, kind of if you like your job and if you want to keep doing it. And I really I really did for the reasons that we discussed. Um, what I learned pretty early in that first section of my career. So this is 37 years now. So, you know, maybe for the first 10 years was I loved the technology and I liked programming. We use languages. You said set the stage for what what it was that, you know, it was like. I'll tell you what it was like. This this is a card. This is an index card. Um, there were these things called punch cards and they had holes punched in them. And that you <laughs> you coded in a language called Fortran. It was like dinosaur days. And you, it, this machine punched out these cards and that was the code that you wrote. And they were like a whole bunch of them in a stack. And if you didn't, and that was the instructions, like instruction one, instruction two, and then come this instruction, you know. And um, if you dropped them on the floor, you were completely screwed unless you had taken time to number your cards because that was your code. And that's literally how we coded. And then you put them in a machine. There's your card stack. <laughs> that was your homework. And then the teacher would put the card stack in the computer and see if the thing would run or if it would blow up. Look oh at you shaking your head. You're like, oh my God. Computers were so big that it took a whole building. Like my whole house would be full of computers. But folks like us never saw the computers because we were on green screen um, terminals. They were called terminals. <laughs> that had a big wire coming out that was into some, you know, routing mechanism that com connected to these mainframe computers, which were in some other building somewhere through some sort of telecommunication that took forever and super centers. Now we call it the cloud and it's sexy and all that stuff and it's personal computers and they have, you know, memory in them and nobody does punch cards. But the philosophy of accessing computer power that's sort of out there, we actually did that then. We just had really ugly green screens and uh, big bulky terminals. Coming out of school and going into that first, you know, 10 years, technology was very, very young and it was mainframe computing. And I remember the first day that personal computers came into our office, it was 1984 or 85. And it was the IBM 5150. It was this enormous thing that sat on a table um, and it was called dual floppy disk. So it had, think of it, it had no CPU, it had no, it had nothing in it. It was just like a big box that would run things. And you put these five and a half inch floppy disk in there to make it run. That was the first, you know, personal computer that came out of IBM. Shortly thereafter, the Macintosh computer came out. It was a little bitty thing with this little face on it that looks like this. And 
um, that became, you know, the, sort of the next evolution of tech. Uh, but it was way before what we have now in terms of personal computing and um, being able to do things powerfully with micro computers, which is what they were called at the time. Um, and then there's been a whole bunch of technology that's dead now, the mini computer, the IBM AS400 series, the DEC series. So healthcare still has a bunch of stuff that runs on these old mainframes. A lot of that first part- <laughs> Well, that might explain the our pace of change in the industry, right? <laughs> that's true, that's true. So those first 10 years were like, you know, being a programmer, learning healthcare. Um, I went pretty early into uh, a consulting company and, um, there I learned that consulting company was acquired by ENY. And that's where I really learned from a management consulting perspective. What does what is the healthcare industry and what do these different sectors do? There are healthcare service providers, there are insurers and healthcare payers, there are pharmacies and um, you know, PBMs, there are manufacturers, uh, there are patients, and how do all of these things weave together? Those are big business problems, big complicated business problems. So I got to apply technology to solving those problems. That's where I got, you know, really, really interested in um, the, the type of thing that that I do now. Um, so I, I had some, you know, so I would just call decent, normal jobs in, in that time frame. But I was recruited to be general manager of a revenue cycle company that happened to be owned by an Anthem at the time, which is a big insurance company. From there, I was given my first CEO job. I was about 30 or 31, um, running a technology company owned by Anthem. And that technology company was giving out these personal computers to doctors so that they would use a computer to file claims electronically with the Anthem insurance companies. And so there were standardization of information, that was happening at the time. Um, standards groups like uh, uh, HL7 didn't really exist, but there was ANSI. So data and data standardization was maturing because people had computers for the first time and began information exchange versus HCA having big computers that just ran HCA stuff. You would have HCA had computers, Anthem had computers, Doctors had computers because we gave them to them. We had a field staff that went out and gave computers to doctors, said, please file your claims electronically instead of filing them on paper. That was in the early 90s. OK, and so that part of my career was how, learning how to run a business unit that was a company A company had that CEO uh, role. Um, and then so that I would call that the first part to interject there on that phase. I mean, you glossed over it, but, you know, you were given this opportunity, a door opened where you're taking on this more senior leadership role. Just, you know, briefly tell us a little bit about, you know, what was that inflection point for you personally? And where, you know, where you, did you feel like you were prepared to take on that additional responsibility? Was it what you were kind of trending towards? Like kind of, how did you make that jump from the first stage to the second stage? When I was in consulting, it was doing well. And it was a great environment for me to imply, apply my strategic mind to, uh, certain problems and help companies solve them. So I was introduced to this revenue cycle management world of healthcare, which I found very interesting because I love math and it was all about numbers and, you know, making numbers true up between, um, you know, what providers were claiming, what insurance would pay and then what patients had to pay. So I, so I liked all that um, and that opportunity came and I took it. And then I learned that I really liked managing a unit of people to, to do a bunch of problems at the same time and get an overall result result when the ceo role came up for the technology company i thought oh my goodness i never would have imagined that i would have an opportunity like this and the reason that i did was because i had a bunch of technical knowledge about edi and revenue cycle and how hospital systems work and how insurance companies work because of all the steps i'd done up until that point and i was a decent uh communicator and manager of, of things. And so my name somehow got into the mix and I was interviewed for it. And I thought, oh, I can, I can definitely, you know, do this. It's great. And I lived in Indianapolis at the time. And oh my goodness, I was so, you know, happy and impressed and everything else um, that I could get to go do this. And you, I had to move to, but you have to move to Louisville. So um, I did move to Louisville and, um, I had a six month old baby and a, a seven year old son. So a seven year old son, six month old baby. And um, I think it was maybe, maybe six months to a year after I got there that I got divorced. So I don't think that I was 
holistically ready. I was, I was career ready, but I, I probably wasn't personal life plus career ready, but I was there, you know, I was there. And so it was a big job. There's a lot of pressure. It was a big company. And um, I did really well in the, in the role. We were really kicking butt. And this is the mid nineties now and really transforming the way healthcare operated through technology by implementing electronic claiming, electronic remittance, and the electronic interaction between providers and insurers for purposes of revenue cycle. Uh, really, really going hard, had huge goals to transform the insurance business away from paper to uh, fully electronic using every digital means possible, lots of money being spent. This was the kind of heyday of ICR and OCR technology, you know, inbound paper converted into. Um, so, so a lot of a lot of heavy work, and then the, the divorce and the the combat, probably the combination of the divorce and the move um, happened at the same time that Anthem took a go public strategy where they were going to become WellPoint. So we acquired Connecticut, and they were going to become WellPoint, and the opportunities for us, uh, those of us who were running separate business units, were changing because those business units we were going to divest. And so, my that's the first time I learned about. How do you package up a business and potentially sell it to somebody else? And so uh, we were we had franchised our business to multiple blues. So I had to negotiate out of contracts that we would no longer do. So there was a lot of change like that. And I'd never done anything like that. So that really got me into what's the transaction side of buying and selling businesses. Um, after that, we had a choice of staying with the insurance company because the, the unit that I ran was gone. You know, it didn't exist anymore, really. It was in the process of being gone. And so in that process, like, would you say it was kind of learning as you were doing, just kind of figuring out what needed to be done at that point in time? I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know how to do any of it. You know, and there were, um, you know, uh, what, are what are all of our contracts with these outside insurance companies? What are our expectations for all the providers we serve? Who's going to run this stuff? How do you, what's it worth? How do you put a value on a business unit? Who might buy it? How would you transition it over? What gets internalized on the Medicare side versus sold on the commercial side? There's a lot of complexity. There was just a lot of OJT there. Um, so, but for me, my choice then became uh, staying with the insurance company and doing something very different um, or doing, uh, you know, doing something else. So I chose then, and, and I, I did gloss over it a little bit because I was only 30 or 31 years old. Um, let me think about that. So Sam just turned 36. Yeah, I was 31. Um, you know, that was a big job at that age. Uh, it's, it's a big, big job at, for anybody doing it now at that age. Um, and so, but I didn't want to go back. I felt like if I just went back into the big insurance machine, I would be going back versus going forward, you know, running a, a business, even though it was a business unit, still running a business. Um, so I wanted to run a business and I had a lot, built a lot of confidence through these various complexities. And I started a consulting firm. HIPAA had passed and all of the HIPAA wave of implementing the technology standards, the information exchange, the privacy and security standards uh, was going into force. And so the whole industry had to learn to adopt it. I had built a very strong personal professional network through my work um, with the various volunteer groups in the technology side of the business, which is again, something I would say everyone needs to really lean into. So HIMSS for me, groups like HIMSS and then doing work, actual work on committees and becoming expert in things, you know, really helped me um, be able to st start my own firm. So that was kind of the middle of my career. And I had my own consulting business for uh, seven years, I think. Um, I kept it at a lifestyle pace because now I was single mom and I didn't really want to overdo things. I was trying to not do the commercial that I had done. You know, I think that's really important. I mean, there, you were balancing this really high intense job and this kind of change based off where the business was headed, but then you had all these dynamics happening in your personal life too. So to what extent was that decision to, you know, adjust the lifestyle, you know, adjust the professional choice based off of what you needed to do to accommodate your personal life? Like, what was that kind of balance? Was it to your point, is it because you had to take on bear more of that single mom responsibilities that you said, I really need to find something and do something that's going to give me that flexibility? Or was it more of a, no, this is actually what I want, you know, to spend my time doing from a healthcare point of view. I know that's not a either or, but you know, what's probably the relative, you know, balance of the two things that you were weighing in your head to make that decision. Yeah. The, the honest answer is that it was 
primarily driven for personal reasons. Um, I knew that I could make a living and make a good living as a consultant. I had learned how to be a consultant at back in ENY days. I had a lot of very specific subject matter expertise that not many people had at the time, and actually still not very many people have in, in general, um, even now. Um, but for me, I was experiencing the uh, devolution or uh, the unraveling of those basic things that, that I believed I had to do all at the same time. And so I said, well, this isn't actually going all that well. <laughs> you know, if one part of the things I have to do is not working now, and what am, what am I going to do and how am I going to handle it? And so I took an enormous risk and stepped away from an extremely well-paying job, secure, to go into a complete unknown. Um, but I had the confidence, the professional confidence that I could do it uh, based on the work that I had done coming into that point. I knew I could count on that part of myself, but I knew that I had to also attend to myself. I knew that I was really struggling with the losses and the disappointments emotionally. I knew I had a lot of emotional work that I needed to do and I needed to be there for my, my sons. And in order to be a mother, which is my you know priority above the other things, uh, I needed to get myself together. And I wasn't gonna be able to do that um, probably on somebody else's eight to five or you know seven to 10 or whatever time frame. I had to I had to invest then in myself and in setting up a different way of working and being. Um, so it was primarily personal, but driven by a professional confidence because of what I had earned. So my encouragement is to women who are in technology or women who are in anything is to, you know, really believe in yourself and follow your intuition about what is right for you at that stage in your life when you have to make a big decision despite what the risks are, because your intuition will, will guide you to, to what is right for you if you can listen to that. And then also just to really believe in your ability to, to win and uh, your ability to, to do it um, with the professional skills and experiences that you, you bring with you. Your life circumstances will change, but what you know and how you do what you do, you know, you bring your that doesn't go away. People can't take that from you and life can't take that from you. So, you know, you can take that into another situation. Yeah, no, that's phenomenal perspective. And thank you for candidly sharing that because I think that's something we don't talk enough about, right? As you know, we're all human beings and we all have, you know, it's not just a, a gender thing, right? Male or female, we all have personal dynamics and different points in our life that pull us in different directions. And I think it takes incredible strength and courage and self-reflection to really consciously, you know, think through what you need to do for yourself to kind of optimize performance, both at home and work. Thank you. I hope so. You know, at the time I, I, I'm not sure I was so conscious of everything. I just knew I was motivated to do and had to act. And then when you're out there on your own, you need to make a living. You know, you got to raise your family. So you, you have a different level of motivation and that worked really well. And I'd tie that together with my opportunity to come into Indion, which I would call the third phase of my career. So at this point now, I'm, you know, um, much more, uh, I know a lot more. I feel even more confident in getting things done because I've advised a lot of different companies at different levels. I had taken on um, a board seat at uh, uh, CareSource, uh, an advisory board seat, not a voting board seat, helping them with their technology evolution as a health plan. So I just knew a lot more. And um, George Lazenby, who became CEO of MDON, this was pre-IPO, and I was blessed to be the first uh, person he recruited into his executive team. And I came in as ex executive vice president in charge of strategy uh, for that enterprise. It was probably 600 million in revenue then in 2008. And we took it to about 1.2 billion. We took it public um, and it was the largest health IT IPO at the time. Um, and so it was a, a extraordinary process and I had corporate strategy uh, as well as product and some PL responsibilities throughout there. And uh, we did, I think, nine acquisitions during that time frame underneath our strategy that I, I helped to create. Um, and so we had quite a successful um, ride there. So 
that was that was a big learning as well. Yeah, that's quite an accomplishment, you know, for that period of time, contrast that to what's happening right now, right? There's so much activity in the health technology data space, whether it's, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the Microsoft Nuance deal and the record levels of funding and digital health companies. I think from your perspective, it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about as a leader kind of navigating that, you know, that IPO process and watching, you know, this company go through that, that big transformation. How did that shift what you had to do from a strategic, not only just like a kind of healthcare strategy, but like you personally as a leader, like what had you have to operate differently or kind of work with your teams differently? Like, was there any kind of inflection point in, in your trajectory that you said, okay, now I have to do things differently? Yeah, it, that's a very good question. So there's a huge difference between being a private company and being a public company. And the 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 primary difference is is governance and reporting. And everybody gets that because, you know, get the SEC over here. Uh, but it really does change the way a company behaves. So um, the way that you make decisions also changes um, as you become public. You're, it's not that you're less entrepreneurial. It's just that there is more structure and, and everything needs to be you know, a little bit more buttoned up. Um, it can, when you do a lot of acquisitions also, things are, it's, it's easier to buy a company than it is to integrate a company that you just bought. And to do that well, and buying a company is not easy. So finding and buying a company is not an easy thing, but integrating businesses is, is, is even harder to do it successfully without losing uh, momentum. Um, the behavior of the business, I would say shifted and, and my role shifted to helping our board of directors understand how our strategy was playing out in the things that we had acquired and what assets we were gonna continue to invest in as a public company, it becomes very much about balancing the market expectations for growth across the portfolio of businesses that you had, because that's a pretty big business. You know, it's a billion two, um, four verticals, payer, hospital, uh, provider, meaning office-based providers, and then pharmacy. So four different verticals, multiple products growing at different rates. So it becomes more about managing to the financial market performance expectations than about um, doing what you might do earlier stage, which is um, you know taking more risk in certain areas. So you can't you have to you have to show up at, on the scorecard. So the conversations then and the decisions that get made that trickle down from if this is what winning looks like in the market on the market scorecard, then how does that trickle down into my three-year plan, my annual budget, my operating plan, the deployment of capital? So how we used capital to do product development became very different. And that becomes, then those things you have to set up. So we had, um, part of my job was to set up an investment committee and capital allocation plan. And then you have to kind of compete to get your idea funded versus just saying, you know, I have an idea, let's build this new thing. For, for those in our audience who may not be as familiar, so MDON then actually, you know, rebranded as Change Healthcare, which is that, you know, large, so many, many people are familiar with Change right now. There's a lot of discussions around, you know, how that company is going to become potentially even larger and working with Optum and others. So I don't know if this is an accurate reflection, Miriam, but, but check me on this, is it seems like your career has really been in that growth stage of these companies where you really get them, you know, to a point, whether it's with the Anthem deal or, you know, with the MD on now change deal, where they kind of hit this point and then they become really large. And then it seems like you like to, you have the option to continue on in that kind of larger organization, but it seems like you actually prefer to jump back into the, the, the deep end and kind of go, go tackle another company. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it is. You know, it's, it is. And I hadn't actually thought about it exactly like that, but I do like uh, solving problems and building things and like the innovation and the fun of, you know, making something better versus kind of just doing kind of the same old thing. And, and, mo and most people do do that. So when I left MD on, uh, which is now changed, it was at the end of 2013. And most of our management team then left because after we took it public, it, we took it back private and we had new private equity owners. And so that's typical for you know, it's a good time for management and, you know, different management changes. I've been there for about six years then, so I was ready to move on. That's when I started doing angel investing because I had never risked my own money on. So I have like three active uh, health IT, health tech investments that I'm involved in. And I helped get our new Cura um, angel investing group off the ground here in Nashville, still actively involved there. 
So then I had the full suite of investing experience from my own money and angel worked, had already worked a lot with venture with private equity and the public market. So I had the whole swath. So um, over the last little part of my career, last five years, I added that in intentionally. Um, I helped a couple of companies that were trying to birth some babies, you know, because they had a couple different friends that were in um, two different spaces. And I really didn't think I'd go back into a daytime operating job, you know, or operating role. But I met uh, a board member from uh, Optimize Rx, her name is Lynn Voss. I met her at the WBL Women Business Leaders in Healthcare Annual Conference accidentally, you know, there are no accidents, um, at, uh, at a reception. And she said, hey, you know, what do you do? Uh, what do you do? Um, maybe you should meet our CEO. I'm on this board. It sounds like, you know, kind of everything there is to know about health IT. We're coming at it from a life sciences perspective. We need to blend the two. And I did. And I became so passionate about the ability for information, this information that life sciences makes available about affordability programs. It's about $7 billion a year in patient financial assistance via copay cards. And then on top of that, all of these patient support programs, most of that money, like think of 90% of that money being unused. And all of that money is just left on the floor that patients could be using. And the primary reason that it's not used is people don't know that it's there. Well, why don't they know that it's there? Because the information isn't distributed in a digital way, like we talked about at the top, uh, to the right people, to the prescribers and to the patients so they can use it when they need it. And so that's now, you know, a part of this whole health equity conversation about, well, how do we, we know how to distribute information for goodness sake. We have the internet now, we have cloud computing, you know, it's not like when, it's not, it's not 1984 or 1985. Yeah, there's no punch cards. So we can do this. We just need to connect these sectors and let this data be liquid um, and let the data flow. So, you know, we need to do that in the right way, structured, secure, all that stuff. Um, but it makes a real difference. So I've really enjoyed it. And it optimized, to your point, tiny company, tiny, tiny company. And um, it was on the micro or, or on the pink sheet, um, penny stock. We up dis, uplisted to NASDAQ. We've had extraordinary, extraordinary growth and, and we're doing really well. Um, and I think doing good while we're doing well. So that makes me happy. I know relationships, as you've kind of talked about, are really important to you and kind of uh, whether it's hymns and kind of having access to network groups, whether it's the fact that, you know, you brought me into kind of the, the Nashville circuit, whatever it may be, but you're always thinking about connecting people and opening doors. I know one thing that you're passionate about for sure within the change context is you're really practicing what you preach in terms of, you know, how do we broaden the talent pipeline, make it more diverse, make sure that we have more women in the STEM careers. And you're really holding the company accountable for, you know, some of these metrics. You're not just talking about it, but you're actually demonstrating that impact with metrics. Talk a little bit of just, you know, briefly of, you know, what you're actually doing there and, and how you're actually, you know, practicing what you preach. Thank you for that. This is the best part of my job. Um, I love my job, but this is the very best part of my job. So um, last year, our CEO, uh, Will Febo, acknowledged Juneteenth and made it a, a company holiday, a paid company holiday. And, you know, Juneteenth is, I never even knew what Juneteenth was, you know, raised in the South. And, you know, it's, there's, there's, it's a, it's a shame. I am ashamed to say, but that's true. And so we, we don't, there are these things that we don't know about our history or they're not promoted that we should, that are all equity and, uh, you know, human rights related. Um, and so that was a bold step. And, and um, we have uh, a largely, white Caucasian workforce, but pretty balanced. We have good female representation, but not a lot of racial diversity in our company. But uh, one of our um, African-American um, colleagues said, you know, hey, look, this is super meaningful. Thank you. And from there, we started um, a diversity and inclusion committee that he runs as a Abbasse, who is one of our uh, commercial sales leaders, outstanding um, individual. And I'm the executive sponsor of that committee. So I get to the, the huge pleasure of working with this team of people. I'm sorry, my ear is itching. Um, huge team of people in the, uh, the company with this passion, not huge team, the small committee of five, six people that have a passion for uh, diversity and inclusion. And we really try to promote that in our culture. But what does that mean? We want to have something that's sustainable. So 
the first thing that we did was take the parity pledge. There's a group called parity.org. And what it says is, if you're going to try to be diverse, then be diverse. And that goes to your hiring practices. So make a pledge that for every job that's uh, a VP level or above, for every position, you will interview one female. That's where it started. But then we added one diversity candidate. So when you're small and growing fast and you're trying to hire fast, you don't wanna do anything that slows down hiring. Uh, but if we're going to make change, we have to be intentional and we have to have things that are systemic. So I'm pleased to say that we do that. It's part of our normal course now um, in our hiring practices. We also have, we use virtual you know, meetings for everything like everybody does, but we have uh, a big tech presence in Croatia and so we take time in our um, sort of all hand, we only have about 80 people in our company, but so when we do an all hands or when we do these virtual coffee hour, virtual ha uh, happy hour type things, we have some intention based on sharing something that's culturally specific to, you know, people and where they live and, and how they work so other people can appreciate that. Um, we've, we've also, you know, set some of our own um, mentoring things in place, which right now is just what's our baseline and how do we want our baseline to grow based on these new hiring practices. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that everybody that works on that group um, wants there to be something that actually moves the ball forward and keeps the ball moving forward. We didn't want to just put a statement on our website or say, you know, anything political about something that is topical. We wanted to be the change that we were talking about. We're actually doing that. So it's an example that even in a small company, we can do that. We can just do that. It's just a choice. Um, and so then you and I can talk this way and we can talk about the power of networking and things outside of our company, but we can also do it in our company. Well, so in our last few minutes together, then I, I want to jump a little bit now to, so, you know, you're at the center of all this action. You're, you're kind of bringing all along other, the next generation of leaders with you. You're kind of at the forefront of healthcare transformation is you kind of take a step back and just think about lessons learned for a second you know, one piece, you know, you talked a lot about expectations that you felt as, you know, kind of a female and, you know, in the healthcare space early on. Is there something that you, you know, kind of believed early on in your career or whether it was something told to you or something that you were kind of made to believe that you now kind of take a step back and say, oh, that's not actually true. That's not how I view the world anymore. I think that I accepted as, as true the, um, the construct of that that commercial that I sang, <laughs> I think I I accepted that as true, as as you know this is this is how it has to be, and uh, we all deal with the imposter syndrome. You'll you'll hear people talk about that if they haven't talked about that already. So we all we all deal with the imposter syndrome. But if you put the female expectation, and then for in my in my case, the additional cultural southeastern you know, Bible Belt, sort of additional cultural expectation on top of that, um, it becomes ingrained in your psyche and it feels like the truth, like the ultimate truth. Um, and so you measure yourself against your ability to meet those standards of ultimate truth. And, you know, what I've learned is um, there's there's probably no such thing as like an ultimate truth. And we're all sort of determining our own paths, um, we can be influenced. We're heavily influenced by our culture, by our families, um, by our DNA, you know, by our heritage. Um, but we really do get to define what success means for ourselves. And that can be really holistic. So for me, it really needs to be about my personal life and my professional life. And it needs to be mind, body, spirit. So I really need to take care of myself physically and mentally and emotionally, take care of the ones I love um, and that I'm responsible to, and then also allow myself to express myself creatively in the world. And for me, a lot of that is business. Business is a creative process for me. So I've come to believe that um, we do get to design that for ourselves. And um, I really didn't believe that early on. I really tried to force myself into doing all of these things. I was very ashamed and embarrassed. I still have a little bit of discomfort being a single 
woman. I feel like, you know, being looked at like, oh, well, yeah, she's just another divorced business executive. And, you know, no wonder she's, you know, she's successful in business, but she can't, you know. So I think we have a lot of those judgments and I just have to let go. I have to accept that those things are out there, but let go of my old sort of belief system. It's really good advice, you know, for everyone listening or watching. And I think it's, you know, you, you've said this to me and I, and I didn't really quite appreciate it until really kind of putting your pieces together. But I think it's just so powerful to show that you can really create your own destiny, right? You said, you know, you kind of broke out of that mold of what was expected to of you. You went into a career path, you know, of computer science that was pretty uncommon, not only for women, but probably kind of in your cultural norms of growing up in, in the South and in your family upbringing. And, um, you know, you, you know, you talked about schools earlier. I, I think we have a tendency a little bit on the kind of technology space to feel like you either have to have gone to this fancy school or, you know, be on the West Coast, whatever it may be. So I think you have really kind of beaten the odds, so to speak, in a lot of those regards. So, you know, congratulations to you for really, you know, charting the way forward on that. I guess I'll, I'll close with, you know, one final question then as you think about the legacy, you know, from a healthcare leadership perspective that you want to to leave behind, what would be the title of your book? The Only Girl in the Room. That would be the title of my book. That's That's been my experience as I have been in so many rooms and gone from, um, you know, being an individual contributor to running businesses to being on boards. And I'm really passionate about changing that. So um, I work with, you know, I would encourage everyone to think about um, networking very seriously, but also volunteering and getting involved in, in technology groups or healthcare industry groups that you're interested in and really do the work so that when you find the room, they, we, we don't know as women where the room necessarily is, that, you know, the, the back room <laughs> or the boardroom. So you <laughs> when you find the room, you're, you're really qualified to be there. And you can show up and bring your presence there. You can feel really comfortable in your own skin. And you walk in there and just do, do your part. Um, and you'll, sh you'll shine. Um, and so I really hope that we can connect more uh, folk that are close to your age and folk that are closer to my age and uh, realize that some of us know where the room is. You know, Some of us found the room. And, and we want everybody to uh, come along with. And you don't have to go to a fancy school. You don't have to be on one of the coasts. Uh, you can get there. Then um, you'll have ups and downs, but you know we all do. So I, I really appreciate the chance to be on this uh, uh, show with you. And I really wanted to thank you for what you're doing because what you're doing is everything we've talked about. You have a full-time gig. You're doing this on top of it because you're passionate about it. Um, you've invested in it. You're putting tons of effort into it and you're raising everybody up by just giving us a place to even talk about it with a lot of intention. Even the title of the, um, the, the podcast, you know, her story is just, let's, you know, let's tell it. Um, it can be lonely. So let's not, let it not be lonely. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for that, Miriam. I really appreciate it. And it's, you know, really a, a testament to all the incredible stories and hard work that, that folks like you have really done. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Good, good luck to you. I know this is going to be a great success. Thanks for doing it.